Paul, thank you very much for joining us. A very, very interesting presentation today. The pace of change won't slow down, which uh, I'm absolutely sure the majority of us will agree. But let me tell you a couple of words about Paul, founder and chair of Provoke Media. He's been writing about PR for more than 25 years. And all you know that there is no one on the planet Earth to know public relations from a site much better than Paul. One day we were traveling with him on a taxi cab from Zurich to Davos. And we were sitting together with Paul on the back seat, just two of us, and it was late in the evening. And Paul said, you know, Max, I never ever work in the public relations business, even for one day, which makes his role absolutely unique because he can monitor and he can look at our business from a side. He is uh, a British from South London and uh, joined PR Week as a news editor in 85, but then in 87 moved to New York to launch the short-lived US edition of that publication. And after that project came into an injurious and worked with Edwick and Edwick Marketing Week for one year. Then early in 2000, Paul Holmes launched the Holmes Group. And you know, Sabre Awards, the Holmes Report, he was inducted into the Eco Hall of Fame in 2011, and I was a witness of this great celebration. But the most important is that Paul Holmes is inducted into our hearts, into our brains, with his experience, with his advices, books, articles. So saying this, I would like to give the floor to the one and only Paul Holmes for his presentation. Paul, please. Thank you, Max, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. It would be a little greater if I could be there, as in Davos itself. Um, it's, it's been a strange year this year. I've done, I've done Cannes from Brighton, uh, and now I'm doing Davos from London, um, which is obviously not the way it's supposed to be. Um, but uh, it's great to have an opportunity to speak with um, some old friends and, and new friends uh, about the changes uh, that are taking place in our industry and where I think those changes are leading us. Um, those of you who've heard me speak before, and um, it's now closer to 35 years than 25 years max that I've been writing about this and talking about this business, um, which means that nearly all of you have, have probably heard some of what I've had to say in the past. Um, the, the themes of this presentation, or at least some of the themes of this presentation, um, will probably seem a little, little familiar. I apologize in advance for that. Um, but hopefully, um, as we go through, there'll be plenty of new material and new ideas and new ways of thinking about uh, some of the themes that we have explored in the past, because what I'm going to try to do over the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes um, is challenge some of the conventional wisdom about our business and um, possibly ask you to forget um, certainly a lot of what you learned when you were first studying public relations um, and also possibly um, forget many of the things that, um, that we consider to be um, almost foundational about public relations. Um, but I wanted to start by just, um, this is a weird way of starting something that's about the future. Um, but I wanted to start by just taking a, a look back over the last 18 months or so um, at what we've learned about um, our business, uh, the world of business more broadly, um, and indeed the world in which we operate more broadly. Um, and see what the, the lessons of the last 18 months have been. Um, I know that um, at the end of March last year, um, I was in New York um, 
holding agency of the year meetings with the top 20 or 30 PR firms in New York and, uh, and simultaneously trying to judge the North American Sabre Awards um, in person, which uh, seems like a very exotic way of doing it now, um, but was how we've done every Sabre Awards up to that point. Um, and um, I remember getting a call from my wife saying, are you gonna come home? and wondering what she was talking about. And of course, I was aware that COVID was, was going on, but I don't think I was taking it quite seriously enough at that point. Um, beginning of the week, um, I was dismissing what my wife had to say and still holding meetings. Um, and people were somewhat remarkably coming to those meetings. Um, I was doing this to welcome them to the meetings in a sort of jokey, um, isn't this ridiculous kind of way. Um, and then by the end of the week, suddenly two thirds of the people that I had invited weren't showing up anymore. Um, others were asking if they could use Zoom. And it was clear that things were getting strange very quickly. Um, I changed my flight on a Friday night and by Saturday night, I was back in London. Um, I have left London precisely once since then um, to go down to Brighton for our first hybrid event, um, the Can Condensed event in Brighton a little while ago. But what mostly what I remember is talking with my management team um, at the end of March last year, beginning of April, and trying to see what we thought the future would look like. And um, like a lot of you, I suspect, we very quickly realized that we had absolutely no idea. Um, visibility at the time was almost zero. Um, it wasn't at all clear whether um, the public relations business was going to go into free fall um, or um, what would happen next. And we had, again, I'm sure many of you were in the same position, um, a sort of plan A, which was not quite business as usual, but involved a very cautious um, approach to all the things that we were doing. Um, a plan B, which accounted for things getting significantly worse. And um, in the back of our heads, if not actually anywhere on paper, a plan Z, um, which was how do, we, how do we survive if this is the apocalypse? And um, we did some research at the time into how public relations people were viewing the world. And most people were somewhere between plan B and plan F. There was uh, a good deal of pessimism. Um, at the time, I think most of the people we spoke to expected their business to decline by something between a quarter and a third. Um, and for that decline to last for nearly uh, a full year, um, in some cases longer. And so the industry was not any more optimistic than I was. Um, what we saw was that none of those worst case scenarios um, really came to pass. Uh, I'm sure there were individual agencies, particularly those focused on the travel sector or the retail business um, that suffered those kinds of declines, 20, 25% off their business um, in the course of the year. Uh, but the vast majority of the industry didn't see anything like that. And our data at the end of the year um, showed two things. First of all, that the overall decline had been in the mid to high single digits, somewhere between five and 10% down. Um, and secondly, that by the end of the year, many people were back at the run rate that they had been at at the start of the year. Um, so it was clear by December of 2020 that the business was beginning to come back. Um, and, and the lesson from that, I think, is that we are, there are maybe two lessons from that. The first is that the public relations business 
um, is more resilient and necessary than it's ever been in the past. Um, clients did not turn their back on public relations. They didn't immediately see it as something that they could um, cut without paying a price for it. Um, and secondly, um, that the public relations business, the, the agency business in particular, is significantly better managed today than it was 20 years ago. Um, I am old enough to remember getting into serious arguments with public relations people at what was then the IPR in London and is now the CIPR in London, um, who um, objected strenuously to me giving a presentation at an IPR meeting in which I called public relations a business. Um, they did not like the idea that public relations was a business. It was a profession. And people who, um, people who thought of it as a business, um, and lots of people mentioned the name Peter Chadlington, or actually as he was then, Peter Gummer, in this connection. Uh, people who thought of public relations as a business were bringing us all down to their level. Um, the reality is that in order to operate professionally, you need to run like a business. There's no conflict between those two ideas. Um, and um, the growth of, of business management in our industry profession, whatever you want to call it, um, is tremendously encouraging to me. And I think that was one of the great lessons that, that, that I learned as we went through 2020 in the first few months of 2021. But there were other things that I found interesting as well. Um, we all discovered new ways of working. Um, you know, there, there's now, I think, a, a conventional wisdom um, around this that, um, that, that, you know, the, the COVID crisis really um, didn't bring anything new to light, but accelerated a lot of trends that were um, taking place anyway. This is or would take place over the next few years anyway. This new way of working is clearly one of them. Um, I think the ability to do what we do um, remotely from home um, actually um, proved to be easier um, with much less friction than many of us would have anticipated. And um, I suspect we'll continue again as part of a hybrid model going forward. Um, looking at um, our experience in the awards business in particular, um, it was fascinating to me that um, the quality of work that we saw in the Sabre Awards this year, um, first of all, the volume was almost identical to um, the, the volume of work that we saw the previous year. So entries were not down significantly. I mean, I think they were down about 1.3% in EMEA and up by about 0.5% in North America. So essentially a wash. Um, we saw the same volume of work and we certainly saw the same quality of work. Um, this was interesting to me because um, in 35 years in this business, I had been sort of indoctrinated into this idea that for creativity to happen in the public relations field and in related businesses, you sort of had to set aside a special room for people to be creative in. Um, you had to have brightly colored objects all around. You had toys in one corner of the room so that you could play while you thought because that encouraged creativity. It was best if you had beanbag chairs instead of sitting around in some sort of formal setting. And you needed all of these sort of crazy accoutrements in order to be creative. Um, as it turns out, all of you were capable of being just as creative, sitting in your kitchens with kids running around in the background and nothing but a screen to relate to. Um, I'm not sure that's a lesson we want to learn going forward because it seems like a very sterile way of doing business. There are other arguments for bringing people together in a room and having them bounce off one another. But it was fascinating to me that we came up with just as many big ideas 
in a screen environment as we ever did in a, in a live environment. And that we came up with great execution and high quality production values and all of the things that have become important to us over the last sort of 10 or 15 years in incredibly challenging circumstances. So in lots of ways, we were much more resilient than we, and when I say we, I mean we at the Provoke Media, but also we as an industry when we did that first round of research, ever thought we could be. Um, and that in itself is sort of inspiring and exciting. Um, the, the other thing that happened during the crisis that was just as exciting to me was that companies remained committed to the idea of purpose in a way that seems almost obvious now, um, because if COVID was about anything, it was about showing that your company stood for something. It was about making sure that your employees and your customers knew that you were putting them first, knew that, that you were taking care of them, knew that you cared about their safety, their health, their well-being. Um, but the commitment to purpose that we saw last year went far beyond COVID. Um, and as I say, it was by no means guaranteed. Um, we've all, I think, most of us on this call are old enough to have lived through um, times when companies quickly jettisoned CSR um, and, and cause-related marketing and all of the good things that they did that were voluntary and optional because times were tough and they had to focus on the core business. That just didn't happen last year. Nearly every major organization not only maintained its commitment to purpose, but in many cases, increased and enhanced its commitment to purpose, not only around COVID, but also around certain issues that were not um, as central to the smooth running of the business as COVID. So I think any company that didn't at the beginning of the pandemic make those sort of commitments to employees and consumers about their safety and their health and their well-being uh, would have paid a price fairly obviously for that. Um, but there was absolutely no similar necessity for them to jump on Black Lives Matter as an issue the way that so many companies did. Um, and in North America in particular, the corporate response to the Black Lives Matter movement was something that I could not have predicted. And what it told me at the end of the year was that purpose was one of those trends that was happening anyway, that probably um, would have been inevitable, but that was quickly accelerated and not disposed of during the crisis. And I suspect that the lesson from that is that purpose-driven marketing, purpose-driven branding, purpose-driven identity is going to be a major part of the future for, public, for corporations in general and for public relations people in particular as we go forward. And I would suggest that this was, to a certain extent, a choice that corporate leaders made. Um, but at the same time, that there was no choice at all. That in fact, what we're talking about here are corporate values. And we have seen over the last 10 years, companies embrace the idea of values-driven leadership um, in a way that is almost impossible to backtrack on. So the idea that companies have values is suddenly pretty uncontroversial. Um, nearly every organization that I deal with, certainly every organization of any size and stature in the world has somewhere on its website, either prominent or hidden, a page that discusses its vision, its mission, and its values. And in most cases, 
one of those values is something, it can either be something explicit like diversity and inclusion, or it can be something more implicit like equality um, or even fairness. But if you believe that equality, fairness, diversity and inclusion are your values, then suddenly when a movement like Black Lives Matter comes along, you don't have a choice. You can't claim to be about fairness and not be about Black Lives Matter. You can't claim to be about inclusion and not be about Black Lives Matter. And what we've seen, I think, therefore, is this understanding that having values is essential, that living values, what we used to call, and I think to a certain extent still can call, authenticity, if we redefine authenticity a little. Um, you know, to me, authenticity means that you live your values. Um, then suddenly being authentic to those values um, is what has the potential to differentiate you from everybody else in the marketplace. And I would argue that one of the things that has changed for public relations over the last year and a half, I mean, I think to a certain extent, this was always true of the best of our profession, um, but now has to be true for all of us, is that job one, is helping organizations define their values, helping organizations um, understand what their values mean, and helping organizations live their values. And values suddenly are absolutely central to everything that we do. And that to me is the lesson of the growth of purpose-driven branding, is that this is now about who companies are, what they stand for, and whether they are prepared to do all the things that standing for those values implies. Um, what was fascinating to me, sort of as an adjunct to this, is one of the other things that, that we've learned over the last 12 or 18 months, um, in terms of what organizations, marketers, communicators, are celebrating more than anything else. And for that, I turn to CAN um, and the return of CAN this year, um, not as an event that is held in the South of France, uh, but as a competition that showcases the best that organizations do in terms of their creativity across multiple disciplines. We just, um, as we do every year, reviewed all of the CAN winners um, in the public relations category. Uh, we ranked them from number one to, I think, number 10. I think there were 10 campaigns that won gold or Grand Prix this year. Um, and the most interesting thing to me, the most interesting new thing to me about the winners um, was not necessarily that they over-indexed towards purpose, which they do. Um, Purpose-driven campaigns are, I would guess, sort of five times more likely to be entered into CAN and three times more likely to win at CAN than anything else. And so they're disproportionately represented in the Gold Lions. Um, but more than that, more interesting than that to me this year was something that I hadn't necessarily seen in the past, which is that we were recognizing, or the jury was recognizing, and I, I, I spoke with Gail Hyman, uh, the CEO of Weber Shandwick, who chaired the Can Lion jury for PR this year. Um, and what was interesting to me was that Can Lion were, were in the PR category they weren't necessarily recognizing um, what you and I would think of as um, earned media campaigns. They weren't necessarily recognizing what you and I would think of as communications campaigns. Um, they were recognizing corporate actions. Um, I'd invite you all to look at the review that we, we did at, at Provoke on, um, on the, the Lions this year. Um, but I'm going to sort of pick two of them to, to illustrate what I'm talking about. 
um, both of which won gold. One of which was called Contract for Change. It was an AB InBev um, Michelob Ultra campaign that helped, um, that, that signed up farmers across America um, to make the transition um, from um, the sort of mass factory farming conditions that exist across most of America to an organic farming model. Um, the numbers on how little farmland in America is organic are quite, um, quite shocking. Um, and there are obstacles to making that transition that Michelob um, and AB InBev sought to counter. Um, the second campaign that I want to talk about a little bit is MasterCard's um, full name, true name campaign, um, which was one of several campaigns that we saw last year uh, that were designed to show companies being inclusive of transgender people um, in many cases for the first time. And this essentially allowed people who, um, who had MasterCard credit cards to have the name by which they identified themselves uh, printed on the card rather than the name that they were born with or the name that was um, you know, on the an unofficial government passports and driver's licenses and everything else. So it allowed people to be called by their preferred name um, and identified by their preferred gender um, rather, than, uh, rather than by the gender of their birth um, or their citizenship. Um, now, what was interesting to me about both of those campaigns was that they broke the mold of can winners um, in that there was absolutely nothing in the communications materials about those campaigns that deserved an award. I mean, they both came with a video um, they both had ads that had run as part of the campaign. Um, they both had earned media efforts supporting them. But if you looked at the communication, the, the, the actual activity that surrounded these campaigns, it was pretty ordinary. It was pretty unexciting. Um, it certainly wasn't award worthy. And so when I talked to Gail, I, 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 when, when we talked to Gail, this came up. And what became apparent was that they weren't being recognized for the communications around the decisions that these organizations made. They were being recognized for the decisions themselves. In other words, AB InBev wasn't being celebrated for how it communicated the contract for change. MasterCard wasn't being celebrated for the ads it did around true name. It was being celebrated for the actions it took. It was being celebrated for its behavior. And this to me is tremendously exciting because it suggests that public relations some of you will have heard me make this point before and forgive me for repeating myself or finding a new justification for saying one of the things I've been saying for years. We have to stop thinking about public relations as a communications discipline and start thinking about public relations as a behavioral discipline. It's about what companies do not what they say. I apologize for the fact that my cat's ass appears to be making an appearance in the in the Zoom screen here. He's moving around behind me. Um, but this is this is an incredible new way of recognizing our business. And by the way, we see this all the time uh, in in Saber. There was a campaign this year from Ketchum on behalf of. Um, a, a windows and uh, uh, a ceiling lighting, uh, ceiling um, illumination company called Velux, which was about the company's commitment to going carbon neutral, not just into the future, but also into the past. In other words, they were aiming to get a point, get to a point where they, they would offset all of the carbon emissions that they had had over the lifetime of the company, this kind of lifetime carbon neutral approach. And again, there was nothing, 
I hope uh, anyone associated with Ketchum will forgive me for saying this, there was nothing in what Ketchum did for its PR dollars in terms of communicating this that made it worthy of best in show in Sabres. What made it worthy and best in show was the action, was saying this is what we're going to do. Actions, not words, are the future of our business. And great campaigns going forward are not going to be defined by all of the things that we say. They're going to be defined by all of the things that we do. Now, along with all of this good news, the winners at Cannes um, present, not for the first time, a warning for our profession and our industry, because all 10 of those winning campaigns were, um, were designed not by public relations agencies, but by ad agencies. If you look down the list of people credited with the um, idea creation and the lead role in these campaigns, they were people like McCann and DDB and FCB and, G and, and uh, Gray Advertising. They were not Burson Marstella, Fleischman Hillard, Ketchum, Weber Shandwick, Edelman. Um, and we've been asking this question, why are ad agencies winning great PR awards at Cannes um, more than PR agencies for a long time now? I'm not sure we have a definitive answer. We have several answers that are somewhat unsatisfying to me. I mean, I think there are structural reasons, which is that there is definitely um, a, a, a template for winning an award at Cannes that ad agencies are better at than we are. They know how to structure their entries. They know how to present their entries. They have the kind of budget to create a, a, a sort of a two minute video that many mid-size agencies who are just as creative and just as forward thinking um, don't have. And so there are structural reasons why this happens. Um, but, uh, another part of it is, I think, that we are trapped in a prison that we created for ourselves over 25 years um, that is about how we present public relations, public relations agencies, the public relations discipline to the world. And one of the things that we are trapped by is uh, what I think is an unhealthy obsession with earned media as the core of our business. I understand that 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, it was really helpful for public relations to present itself as an alternative to advertising based on both price and value, and also the credibility of third party channels. And I certainly don't um, question the decision of those people who, as I say, 25, 30, even 40 years ago, saw public relations in terms primarily of earned media. Um, because I think at the time, there was a very strong case to be made. I've made it myself. Um, in the past, that earned media was um, because of the credibility that it brought to the equation, um, more valuable, more powerful, um, more important than paid media. Um, in a, to a certain extent, I still think that's true. Um, you know, I, I would make the case a few years ago that earned was important uh, because the currency that corporations needed more than any other was the currency of credibility. And that there is a continuum with control at one end and credibility at the other. The more you control the message, advertising, the less credible the message is. The more you surrender control over the message, PR, earned media, 
the more credible the message is. And that was incredibly important and to a certain extent is still incredibly important. But what I would say we have seen over the last 10 years is that the connection between earned media and credibility is no longer the linear connection that many of us grew up with. And there are two or three reasons for that. The first reason is that the credibility of earned media has been in decline and quite possibly in a death spiral. Earned media no longer carries the, it's there in the papers, it must be the truth quality that it had when I came up as a journalist. And I say that with great sadness. The second thing that has happened that is related to that, that is related to that, is that all of those things that we think of as earned media, newspapers, magazines, television, radio, are much less important, much less central to media consumption than they were 10, 15 years ago. They have been overtaken by social media and other forms of word of mouth as the main source of information for a great many people. And while all of those social channels have credibility problems of their own, um, they have become more important in the dissemination of corporate messaging than traditional earned media have become or have been. And then as part of the same equation, that means that credibility is to be found elsewhere. And I would argue that today, and certainly in the future, as we move forward, credibility will be found not in the channel that we use, but in the source of the information. Corporations will not be able to borrow the credibility of the channel that they use to disseminate their information in the same way that they could 10 or 15 years. And again, I'm not saying this is going away completely. I'm not saying that it isn't still great to get the right person at the New York Times to disseminate your message and tell people how great you are. I'm not saying that there's no value to being on the front page of whatever the leading business magazine in your market is. But at the end of the day today, credibility is going to come from you, not from channels you use to communicate. Credibility is going to be about how authentically your organization lives those values that I was talking about earlier, not about whether a person at the New York Times says you're the next big thing or your new product is terrific or any of the things that we have traditionally associated with, with great PR. Great PR is going to be about how your organization lives up to its values in the real world. It is under constant observation. And I would argue that today, the real world has a pretty good handle on how credible your clients are, how credible each of them really is going forward, and whether they are in fact authentic. And there is a willingness to challenge inauthenticity, which means that the price of being not credible has gone up and the speed at which your lack of credibility will be discovered and exposed has gone up. And that means that public relations has to be the guardian of your values, the guardian of the, the discipline that tells you how to live those values in the real world, and the source of your continued credibility and authenticity. And again, that is not about the channel you use. It's not even about your communications messaging. It is about your fundamental behavior as an organization. And if public relations isn't adding value to how you live, not how, what you say, then it's going to fall increasingly by the wayside, not because all of these things become less important, but because there are going to be other people who claim to be able to do them at least as well as we can. And um, 
I think we started a little late, so and I, I I probably got another five or ten minutes that I can that I can continue with this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go on until Max starts making sort of shut the fuck up. The whole more. time on the planet Earth is yours, Paul. Okay. So I think that there are a number of ways in which we must change. And I'm not necessarily targeting this at everybody in this room because look, we have a self-selecting sample here uh, around this virtual table or in this virtual conference room, um, whatever metaphor you want to, to, to live by. Um, we have, I think here, a self-selecting sample of the business um, that is already to, to the maximum extent possible, at least, living and operating in many of the ways that I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not suggesting here that I am presenting you with a way of, of looking at this business that you haven't at least thought about before and that you haven't at least tried to implement in, 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 in the past already. Uh, but I am suggesting that it is going to be absolutely critical for the future of our business, not only that the, 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 the an audience of 20 or 100 or 500 um, leading PR practitioners start to think this way, but that as an industry, we all or the vast majority of us start to think this way. And we have to go out, I think, and evangelize to our peers, to our colleagues, to the next generation of practitioners that these things, values and action and credibility and authenticity are absolutely critical to the future of our profession and its cent continued centrality um, as a corporate leadership discipline. And so how do we need to change? The first thing, which stems from the last thing I said, is that I think as a discipline, we need to embrace channel neutrality, absolutely. We have to stop saying, oh, that was an ad campaign, not a PR campaign. There is absolutely no reason why advertising and paid media cannot be part of what I would like us to start thinking about as the public relations mix, right? We're all very comfortable with the idea of the marketing mix. We're all very comfortable with the idea that you can reach consumers and persuade consumers and get consumers on your side using a vast array of discipline. Public relations is just and again, I'm sure most of you have heard me say this before. Public relations is just a much bigger, more inclusive version of marketing. It's about consumers and employees and shareholders and communities and the political realm and the media. And there's no reason why you can't use the full range of tools that we think of as being part of the marketing mix as persuasive tools to reach all of those stakeholder groups. And if we are going to continue to say, no, no, where, where I've even, I, I like the idea of earned first, for, and here's what I think I mean by that is I like the idea of earned first because I think today everything is earned. Yes, you can pay for a 30 second commercial, but you have to earn that commercial being watched and acted upon. It's earned in the sense that if you're just shouting at people through a screen, delivering a message that is all about how great you are, people are going to turn it off. But if you have the right advertising message, that can work as an earned message. If you can earn people's trust through advertising, and just think of the, the great ad campaigns that have spun up around some of the purpose-driven stuff. Think of, think of the advertising that Dove does um, around its Real Women campaign. Pretty much every Unilever brand now has something like that. Think of the advertising that um, Procter & Gamble did around Like a Girl. To me, that was a great example of paid media as public relations, because that was a public relations message. It was a message about the relationship between that organization and its stakeholders. And that, I think, is the way we have to start to think. Not that advertising people are 
straying onto our turf when they come up with these great can award winning campaigns. Um, not that we have to stay in our swim lane and focus on earned, but that it's all our turf. Our turf is anything that can build a relationship and help an organization live its values authentically. And we have to start thinking in terms of all of the channels, not just a few of them. <clears throat> Secondly, we have to start, and this is, this is, I think, essential to the first, we have to start thinking about ourselves as counselors first, not as executioners, not as tacticianers, not as communications deliverers, but as counselors to management. Because if you look again at those campaigns that I mentioned, the True Name campaign, or the Contract for Change campaign, or the Velux campaign, the value that they added to the organization wasn't in how they were communicated, it was in what the company did. And we have to start delivering that value by advising our companies to take smart, strategic, brand building, reputation building, relationship enhancing actions. Now, one of the things that that implies is that we have to start thinking very seriously about how we get paid. Because if we're still getting paid by the hour, if we're still getting paid for the stuff we produce, not for the thinking that we bring into the executive boardroom, then there's going to be a disconnect between the value we add and what we get paid for. So we have to start now, I would say, training our clients to think not about how much we deliver on the back end of an idea in order to get you know, $500 an hour, $250 an hour um, for our executional capabilities, we have to start thinking about how we get paid for great ideas. And that can't be an hourly number. A great idea that takes you 20 minutes to think up in the shower in the morning is not worth less than a great idea that comes from having 25 people with all of their billable hours sitting around a table for two days thinking about a problem. We have to be paid for our solutions, not for our executions. And that's something we're going to have to train our clients to value and also, also train ourselves to value and nurture within our own organizations. Um, the third thing that I think we have to change, and again, everybody who um, was in Davos five years ago will remember me um, talking about data and the fact that every organization in that room needed a chief data officer. I still believe that if we are going to move in this direction, if we're going to become channel neutral, and if we're going to become counselors first, data is absolutely central to that equation. We need, I, I, again, forgive me for repeating myself. I know I've said this to you before. The person with the best data will have the best insight. The person with the best insight will have the best strategy. The person with the get best strategy will lead change within organizations. If we don't have great data, we cannot drive change effectively. And we have to have the knowledge and the insight and the ability to say to our clients, this is the next issue that you're going to have to deal with. It's coming around the corner now. You need to be prepared for it. You need to jump on it. You need to be the first organization to take advantage of it as an issue to define your character, your values, your personality, your authentic self. And you need to do it using all of these channels um, <coughs> that we have at our disposal. And that becomes about knowledge first and foremost. That ability to see around corners is going to be critical to us. And some of it is instinct and some of it is experience, but some of it resides in the data. It resides in the ability to mine social media and the real world for information about what trends are taking off and what issues are coming up and how to be ahead of them. The fourth thing that we need to change 
and this is another way in which we need to push back against our clients, is we need to hold their feet to the fire and make sure when they come to us as public relations people, they know what they want. A year or two ago, I started to analyze how Sabre Award winning campaigns were measured. And um, I got about 150 campaigns deep into the Sabre Awards, looking at the way that they were measured, looking at the metrics we were using. And I came to um, an alarming recognition, which was that often we weren't measuring at all or that we weren't measuring anything that I thought mattered. Um, and so I actually then took a step back and started to look at what were the objectives for this campaign? And here's what I found. Almost half of the campaigns that we judged in Sabre didn't have any objectives at all. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that the, 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 the campaigns didn't have objectives because that sounds silly, right? But there was no stated objective at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, <coughs> nobody thought it was important to tell us what the objective was, partly because I think they thought if they came to a PR agency, the objective implied is they wanted to get PR. Um, and by that, they meant they wanted to get earned media coverage. Um, I hope that the, the sort of half an hour or so that I've been talking about this already um, helps you to understand why I don't think that's much of an objective at all, or certainly the objective that we should be focusing on. The second, the, the, for those campaigns that did have a stated objective, however, in almost 90% of the cases where there was a stated objective, that stated objective was something along the lines of to raise awareness. Um, we wanted to raise awareness. Um, Sometimes it was a little different. You know, we wanted to build buzz. Uh, we, wanted, we wanted to go viral. Um, but, but in most cases, it was some variation of we wanted to increase awareness. Um, I have to say that um, I think awareness is, in most cases, at best an intermediary objective. And I think if your client comes to you, and this is one of the things we have to learn if we're genuinely gonna be counselors. Um, if your client comes to you and says, I want you to raise awareness of X, your first question should be something along the lines of, for what? Why do you want that awareness to be increased? Not, you know, objective, not, not awareness as a goal in and of itself, but awareness as a as a means to an end. All right. If you're if you're raising awareness because you want to sell more X, that's fine by me. Even better is if you're raising awareness because you think it will increase and enhance the relationship between your organization and its stakeholders. Then <coughs> I think that's terrific. Um, but awareness without any sort of understanding of what the purpose of awareness is, is incredibly sort of short-sighted and, and, and inadequate. Um, and it's something that we as agencies, because at the end of the day, we're going to be asked to prove that a campaign worked, need to be able to push back on. Um, awareness, and by the way, when people say that their objective is to raise awareness, the result is nearly always 100 million media impressions. I don't want to, or some variation thereof. I, I again, don't want to sound like I'm talking down to you, but um, you must all be aware of the fact that saying you got 100 million media impressions does not prove that you raised awareness one iota. 
Um, if you're going to be held accountable for awareness, you need to do pre-campaign awareness and post-campaign awareness research, and then show that you move the needle. If you want to say, you know, people are aware that we stand for, in, in the case of um, uh, trans, uh, transgender rights, for example, that we stand in favor of full equality for transgender people, it's not enough to get have an ad and a, a PR campaign and a ton of media clips. You have to show that people actually did become more aware that that was something you stood for. Um, this is this is all fairly basic stuff, but we have to start pushing back against clients who set crappy objectives and then are disappointed when the impact of the campaign is less than they want it to be. And that leads to the fifth thing that we need to start doing, which um, you'll be not at all surprised to know is, is the, the, the thing that I want to focus on is the, at the, the end of this process is we need to start demonstrating that what we do really moves the needle, really changes behavior, really changes attitudes and, um, and, and the way in which people relate to organizations. And I, there, there are two things that I think we need to start thinking about uh, based on what I've been saying today. One of them I've talked about before and I'll, I'll, I'll end with, but I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um, one of them is going back to that point about values and authenticity. Um, and this is a question that I think you can, or a series of questions that I think you can ask internally on a sort of ongoing rolling basis as a reality check for how well you're doing in terms of authenticity of values. And it's three simple questions that you can ask your employees every six months, every year, whatever you're comfortable with. Do you know what our organizational values are? Do you believe that management lives up to those values? Do you believe that you personally are empowered to make decisions based on those values? And if your employees can answer yes to those three questions on a consistent basis, I would argue that your organization is extremely well insulated against a values-driven crisis, pretty well insulated against a brand crisis, um, and um, can be confident going forward that it's doing things and um, saying things that, that are resonating with your audiences outside of the organization. Your employees, better than anybody else, have great bullshit detectors for whether what you say matches up with what you do. They know the organization, they know how it operates. And if they are confident that you're living up to your values, the chances are you can be confident too. And then the final thing is we need to start measuring our campaigns in terms of what I think is at the core of all of this. <clears throat> the word that is important in public relations is that second word, relations. We are the people who, based on authentic values-driven actions, build, nurture, and when necessary, leverage the relationship between our organization and all of the people in society with whom it interacts and upon whom it depends. And we have to find ways of measuring those relationships. Do you trust us? Do we have the credibility? Do you think we're authentic? Do you think that we live up to the expectations that you have of us? If not, how are we failing? I've talked in the past about net promoter score. Would you recommend us um, as a place to buy products, as a neighbor, as an employer, um, as a company to have on your side in a political um, debate or a political argument? Do you want us as a partner with your family, your organization, your beliefs? And those are the things that matter going forward. Those are the things that show you how an organization is 
living up to the expectations of its stakeholders and the society in which it's op it operates. And once again, that interface between organizations and society, between our clients and the world in which they operate, is where we have to start to add value. We the, the, All of the things that we've been good at, I don't want to leave the wrong impression about, about either, you know, traditional PR, I hate that, that term because this all ought to be traditional PR. Um, but, but certainly this whole idea of, you know, media relations and media. Um, I don't want to say that that's not important going forward. I don't want to say that communications isn't going great, important going forward. I don't want to say that great content quality and real creativity, all of these things are going to be important for getting the kind of attention that you need to make these messages resonate. But at the end of the day, your organization's values, its authenticity in terms of those values, the actions it takes to demonstrate that those values are real. That's where public relations has the great opportunity going forward to add value, to be more important than ever, to become part of the dominant coalition within organizations, to really elevate itself to the role where the chief reputation officer, the chief relationship officer is at the same level as the CEO, the CFO, the chief legal officer, all of those other people who are part of leading organizations and making sure that they are relevant going forward. And that's what I think we've learned. And that's what I think we have to not only prepare for as a discipline and as a profession, but start to accelerate. Because if we don't get there soon, somebody else will. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much indeed for paying attention for uh, what turned out to be more like an hour than 45 minutes. Thanks a lot, everybody. Well, Holmes. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. Applauses to our dear friend, Paul. As usual, global thinking and uh, very well structured and really appreciations. First of all, I would like shortly to apologize about 25 years, 35 years, but if you go to the Provoke, Provoke Media website, you will see your official bio, bio is saying 25 years. So, I know, I haven't updated it in a while. I need to actually just give you the year when I started doing this, and then you can do the math. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a detail. Paul, there are a couple of questions. Uh, I can save on a lot of them on the chat session. Do you want to go over them? And um, why, don't, why don't you moderate, Max? Um, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So there is a question from our good friend, Rod Cartwright. Be it from Cairns or more broadly, do you still see in the hard edges ECG era too many purpose-led campaigns and communications approaches which are too marketing-led rather than being whole business endeavors which start with underlying organizational behavior? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and... Um, and, and there are reasons to be concerned about that. Um, first of all, um, I think we still see a lot that is, um, you know, that, that, that doesn't understand all of the things that I was saying um, earlier about values and authenticity and actions and not words. It was great this year to see more stuff that was action based rather than um, rather than, than words, than, than, than just communication. Um, but that's certainly still a flaw. Um, you know, I, and, and I suspect that we can all think of campaigns that have been more about organizations making the right noises um, than they have about real substantive action. Um, and, um, you know, I think... I don't want to, I don't, I don't, there's something weird about the fact that this is still the first campaign that I think of um, when I think about this. Um, but, but they're a great, it, it, it's, a, it's a campaign I think everybody will remember. And it's easy for me to make the points I want to make about the difference between a PR driven and a, and a marketing driven approach by looking at this campaign. 
Um, and it's the, the BP Beyond Petroleum campaign, which has got to be like 20 years old now. Uh, but it was, to me, a classic example of an organization that knew what people wanted to hear and where the marketing folks were like, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's say that BP doesn't stand for British Petroleum. It stands for Beyond Petroleum. And it stands for the fact that we're now this forward-looking, environmentally friendly, um, you know, sort of socially conscious organization. And so ads started to appear, articles started to appear. Um, everybody talked about how BP had moved beyond petroleum. Um, then um, a couple of things happened in quick succession. There was an explosion um, somewhere. And then there was the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico uh, that was the biggest pollution event in the US. Uh, since the Exxon Valdez ran aground about 10 years earlier. And, um, and that was because BP's words had gotten a long way ahead of its actions. At the time, I argued that the public relations approach to, and look, I know, that, I know that there is a tendency out there in the world beyond our industry, and sometimes reprehensibly, even within our industry, to use the term just PR to mean something that is cosmetic, not real. That is not and never will be the sense in which I use the words public relations. What I think a public relations approach to this problem would have been, would be to say, okay, we want to get to a point in the future where we can legitimately and authentically claim to be beyond petroleum. What does that mean? What, what milestones would we have to hit before we claimed that legitimately, honestly, truthfully? And secondly, what are the behaviors we need to encourage within our organization in order to get to those milestones. One of the first things I would say was part of a public relations solution to the beyond petroleum message would be to say, okay, we need an internal communications campaign to emphasize health and safety and environmental performance. And part of that needs to be and I said this at the time and used to get looked at a scan by PR people for suggesting it. Public relations people in, the, in, in BP needed to say to management, if you want to talk about if you want to talk about being beyond petroleum, the first thing you have to do is change compensation for every single one of our managers, every single one of our engineers, every single one of the people who is responsible for our operations. You need to change compensation so they are being rewarded for environmental health and safety goals at least as much as they are being compensated for productivity. Because if you don't change behavior in the organization, you are gonna continue, no matter what you say in public, to prioritize monetize one behavior over another, and it's not the behavior that you want to talk about. If you genuinely want to be beyond petroleum, you have to pay people differently. You have to reward them for environmental health and safety performance and not for cutting corners and getting a little bit more oil out of the ground a little bit faster. And there was no organizational willingness to do that. And at that point, somebody should either have said, we need to get more willing or we need to go back to saying, hey, we're a big oil company, deal with it. And that to me is the difference between PR and marketing and that approach. And yes, there are far too many organizations that are still about saying the right thing and looking good in the short term. But as I said earlier, if you do that today, you'll be discovered much more quickly. You'll be punished much more severely. That kind of inauthenticity is becoming untenable for organizations. Um, and yeah, we have to change it. Thank you very much, Paul. There is a question from Jacqueline Strayer from the United States. She's our board member. It's a more statement than a question, but Jacqueline, if you're online, so you can add your, your question if you want. She says, we look at four types of media that are valued, 
earned, paid, shared, and owned. And it is evaluated based on who are your stakeholders are and what they pay attention to. Jacqueline, do you have a question to Paul Holmes? No, no, I don't have a question. I was just putting that in the chat. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I, clearly we have to become masters of all of those. Um, or we at least need to offer up solutions that uh, with an understanding of how those four work together um, to, to build messaging and to deliver it to a wider audience and to show that you're delivering on that messaging. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily suggesting that we need to be creating all of the solutions, that's part of being a counselor, but we need to understand and be willing to recommend each of them in the appropriate circumstances. Thank you. There is a question from Atu. In India, earned media is directly connected these days with those who advertise the most. The distinction between earned and paid is blurry. That wasn't a question, that was an observation. Just a statement, okay. Question yeah, I, from... It's interesting. That, that, that varies from market to market. Um, if you'd asked me that question 15 years ago, I would, I would have said it was an emerging markets problem. Um, but the reality is that we've been racing to the bottom, not to the top. Um, and I see that now in you know, what I would have thought of 15 years ago as sophisticated, evolved, developed markets. No, what's interesting um, Paul, is that today the government is India's largest advertiser. And then you have people saying, oh, how come media is supporting the government in everything it does? So, yeah. yeah. Question from Chandana from beautiful Mumbai. What should corporations do to get the communications related to ESG rights? Um, I hope to a certain extent that my BP answer um, answered some of that. Um, which is just make sure that you're not over-promising, make sure that your organization and your operations are aligned with the promises that you do make, make sure that you're accountable, make sure that you have metrics for showing the progress you're making, make sure that you are listening to your critics and in dialogue with your critics constantly, um, even those critics who you know you'll never win over, um, you have to understand where they're coming from. Um, we've talked about this in the past, but I think that you know that the, one of the leadership qualities that is became this is another great example of um, the pandemic accelerating things that were already happening. I think that the one leadership quality that the CEOs needed through the pandemic and will need more than ever going forward um, is empathy. Uh, that means being able to understand and uh, value the input of people with whom you disagree. That all of these people are affected by your operations. Whatever their motives, they have a real point of view, and you need to be able to listen to it. And if you don't have a CEO who is blessed with innate empathy, you need to be the empathizer in chief. You need to be the person inside the organization who brings in those views from outside and helps management understand what they are and why they are and why they matter to the organization going forward. And that, that's, at the, that's at the core, I think, of good ESG communications. Um, and implied in the question, I think, is that ESG is more important now than it's ever been. It really matters. It matters not only to communities and NGOs and all the people who've traditionally bitched about it, it matters to your shareholders. It's a big factor in evaluating risk of investment. Um, and that's only, again, going to accelerate going forward. Pace of change will not slow down. Thank you, Paul. I think the last question from Vishwendra Verma. From PR perspective, when would you recommend paid? What would you recommend, paid or earned media? 
or it's largely based on the organizational appetite? Um, to a certain extent, it's certainly based on budget. Um, there, are, there are clearly constraints in that regard. Um, I think that I think that, that really what you have to do is understand the, the different value that each brings to the table and the way in which they amplify each other and can extend the reach of each other. Um, and, and I think, by the way, a lot of organizations still um, <clears throat> get, get this slightly wrong in that um, there are a lot of organizations, I, again, I saw a couple of campaigns that fit this description of, from CAN, where it was like, okay, we have this great ad um, that, you know, um, is really fun and creative. Let's get PR for the ad, right? Let's, let's get the ad shown on the nightly news. Let's get people to talk on social media about the ad. Whereas I think the best approach is let's use the advertising to um, amplify great earned media coverage to other audiences. So we had a great earned idea. It was a great live event. It was a great. Um, it was a. It, it was a great social media thing. It got this endorsement by this um, unpaid. Um, journalist, celebrity, influencer, whatever. Let's take that and make sure that everybody knows about it. Um, but, uh, and clearly you can reach more people more quickly via paid media if you have the budget to do it. Um, but the essential thing is that the message you're, you, you're getting out, whichever channel you've chosen, has to be that important public, authentic public relations message, not the kind of self-aggrandizing that has been at the heart of advertising since, you know, sort of P&G started running ads in, you know, the New York Daily Herald 150 years ago. Thank you very much, Paul. Any other questions? One last question. No? So, ladies and gentlemen, it was a brief, relatively brief and very, very interesting and knowledgeable session, part of the online Davos Communications Forum. And we've been with Paul many, many years together in Davos. And I hope that next year, early March, we will meet again in Davos, Switzerland. And I would like to thank you, Paul, from the bottom of our hearts. Really thank you. The record of this session will be tomorrow on the website of the World Communications Forum Association. And from the board, from all our members, I wish you a very happy summer holidays and see you very soon in September. Hey, thanks. And, and look, I thank you to the World Communications Forum. Uh, you guys do more for the development and evolution of this profession in some of the far-flung corners of the world um, than almost anybody that I know. Um, you know, I think I put you guys up there with ECO and the Arthur Page Society and all of the other groups that are working to improve and um, and add value to our profession. And you're a great ally and partner in that regard. Um, and I'm glad that you found a way to continue the, the communications forum um, without the in-person meeting in Davos. Uh, but like you, um, I hope that, that we're able to come back to, um, to a live event where I can network with friends and, and uh, and have conversations over coffee as well as uh, just delivering remarks. So thanks very much, Max. And we value very much partners and friends like you, Paul, and professionals like you. So thank you and happy summer holidays. Thank you all. Thanks, we love everybody. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. Bye.